Hi everyone, I'm Clark with CK Med, and this episode is powered by Med School Tutors, your resource for one-on-one -on -one online tutoring for the USMLEs, shelf exam, and even the residency application process. Our tutoring incorporates custom study schedules, content mastery, and even test-taking strategies that you're not really going to get anywhere else. And I know this because I used to be a student with MST before I even tutored here. For a free phone consult, use the link in the description below. Mention that you heard about MST from CK Med on YouTube and use this discount code CKMedPlus for your special pricing. I hope you enjoy the video. Hello everyone and welcome to CK Med. My name is Clark and I'll be taking you through blood, lymph, and cardiovascular infections today. I want to shout out to Nikki Shaw for creating the backbones of this PowerPoint as I have adapted it, added in extra details that you need to know for your USMLE Step 1 exam. Now this is the first of your systems microbiology. You've now covered the basics of microbiology. And so what I'm gonna be taking you through in each of these modules is how to figure out what is the backbone of the stem, what is your diagnosis of uh, what infection the patient has in each of your clinical vignettes, and then figuring out from there what particular details the questions are looking for. At this point in time, you've covered your basics. What is microbiology? What are bacteria, viruses, parasites, and hopefully fungi? You've covered what those are in general. Um, you should have covered a little bit extra about your viruses. Uh, I'll be covering in just a second. But how to approach your systems microbiology is a little bit different than you have covered so far. So some helpful tips as far as where you start from. Uh, because you're going into system infections of the liver and uh, blood, uh, I know some of the modules of our liver infections might be in different locations. So uh, I have put it here, uh, but it is kind of tied in with your GI uh, infections, which I have another video for that. Um, but as for bacteria, uh, the, the thing, if you haven't done it already, is go into your first aid book. And in there, if you don't have it, get the file uh, for the PDF and go in and open up your microbiology section. And in there, there's a gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria flow chart, um, or there's two of them, one for gram-positive and one for gram-negative. And you should start working on memorizing those charts because uh, from now on, you're gonna be having questions that want you to diagnose not only just from someone's presentation, but also lab results. Uh, found within your stems what infection specifically this person has and you need to know what those results are and what they mean. So as we're going, uh, because this is the first module when I come across those um, kind of tests, we're going to be describing what they are um, and, and what they kind of differentiate from uh, different organisms. So uh, again, first aid, those flow charts for those bacteria. As far as viruses, if you haven't done so already, uh, it should be time that you need to jump into memorizing genomes of viruses uh, and the Baltimore classification if you already haven't done so. In addition, uh, what are the viruses that are found within each of those classes and the groups? Right, so uh, hepatoviridae or picornaviridae, those are groups of viruses that are found within a certain genome um, separation. And so uh, organizing that uh, might help you a little bit as far as um, remembering some of these viruses. Uh, other things that you should definitely know for viruses are what are the structures? Do they have envelopes? Uh, what are the shape of them and the genome? These are very high yield testing points. Um, and how you kind of approach this, this is how I approached it for my microbiology course, um, is every time I got a new viral infection, so let's say we're in skin, we're learning about xanthems in children. So I have a ch child that comes in with a classic presentation of measles. You will be learning those when we get there, but as far as right now, a classic presentation of measles is in my stem, right? And if they were to ask me, what is the genome type? This is where my studying hopefully came into effect. So every time you learn about your different viruses or your different infections that uh, a child or an adult have that are, are of viral origin, stop and pause if your slide doesn't mention what is the genome or what group it uh, kind of falls into. Uh, does it have an envelope or is it naked? If that is, information isn't there, go find it so that you keep reminding yourself, okay, I know my measles virus is 
uh, related to my orthomyxoviruses. It is not an orthomyxovirus, but it is a paramyxovirus. And a paramyxovirus, I know, is a negative sense single-stranded RNA virus. And that then organizes myself as far as how it replicates. Um, in addition, some of the other basic features found within our uh, viral infections. And so um, that is kind of how you approach it. You get an infection, go back to the basics for every single one. Um, that will help you a lot, uh, as most viral infections are pretty much pointing out what uh, are these fine details for it. For parasites, it's a little bit straightforward, uh, or a little bit more straightforward, I guess I should say. Um, and helminths and protozoal infections, you really need to know what they look like. Um, that's really, really important that every time you get one of them, look up what the egg looks, uh, looks like if it's not given on your, uh, your lecture slides. Uh, definitely look what the organism itself looks like. Um, sometimes uh, the worms look a lot alike, and so that might be not, uh, or that might not be an important thing that they put into um, a stem or into a picture for a question. However, if an egg is very distinguishing for some of these organisms, that might be a little bit more high yield uh, as far as some questions for your course. Um, in addition, there's information like infective and diagnostic stages. If it's weird. And I will emphasize that when we get to those organisms, if it's really weird, um, then you should memorize it or else just have a basic knowledge of it uh, as that is very low yield uh, on questions for parasitology. For mycology, also known as uh, uh, the study of fungi, um, it's very important to know the microscopy and histology of these infections. Not only what it looks like, so if I showed you a picture and you can, and you can diagnose it from it, but also how to describe it in words. Um, this is some of the most difficult questions you will come across in microbiology. And if you can master that, uh, there's no problem that you'll get all the microbiology questions on your step one. Uh, they're very tricky in how they word and describe how a fungi buds or is shaped or does it have a capsule or does it have weird structures that it forms like germ tubes and those sorts of things come up as each of these infections um, are explained in each of the modules. And I'll definitely emphasize those when we get to them. Uh, but how to study them, pretty much do the same thing as viruses. Every time you get to a new infection or repeat an infection, just go back, what is the basic understanding of this? What does it look like on microscopy? And you'll master those questions. Other big suggestion, definitely do sketchy. Um, I have some information there for you to read. Um, but it definitely helps with epidemiology, the symptoms, uh, and they have really good ways at remembering things beyond uh, what I kind of present through these important. So now we're gonna discuss some of our hemorrhagic fevers. Um, these guys, um, a couple of them are pretty high yield and I'll just kind of uh, breeze through some of the other guys uh, so that we can get to the blood infections. So uh, Ebola virus, I'm sure you've heard about it in the news in the last uh, few years. Um, definitely not recently, I guess, uh, but a few years ago, there was an outbreak in, um, in West Africa that was uh, quite rampant and uh, quite hysteric uh, to the people in the villages, thinking that uh, doctors coming into the areas were here to steal their blood. Instead, they were trying to help and isolate this infection so more people didn't die but uh, everyone was telling them that they're coming in to steal your blood and your body and your family members. And so people started running off into the forest and escaping and not getting the help that they needed. So transmission for this guy is uh, you can get it from fruit bats and pigs, primates, and even humans who have contracted the virus. So that's why I got these cute little bat guys up here. Oh, they're so cute. Um, and it's pretty much just found uh, in Bushmen and hunters in Africa. Uh, there hasn't been really any outbreaks anywhere else. Um, so pathogenesis for this um, isn't that important. Just to know that uh, it is very uh, damaging virus. So once it starts replicating in our cells, uh, it starts kind of destroying everything. So tissue necrosis in the spleen and liver and lymph nodes, everything. It causes cytokine storm. And because endothelial cells start to separate due to not only cytokine storm, but also due to the CPE of the virus, um, it's our cytopathic effect. Uh, it starts leaking vasculature uh, into tissues. And th so that's why we call this a hemorrhagic uh, fever. 
If the hemorrhage is severe enough, especially in internal organs, it can cause hypovolemic shock uh, and death. Uh, in order to kind of separate it from Marburg, this usually has no rash. It's usually just bleeding uh, from everything. It's not a rash necessarily. Uh, it usually takes about 12 days um, to pretty much uh, die off from this. Um, one of the first things you see is like a severe sore throat, which really doesn't help because someone that has strep throat can have a really severe th sore throat. Someone that just contracted HIV can have a se severe sore throat. So it doesn't really help. Uh, and so diagnosis is kind of looking for the virus itself or um, seeing the later onset symptoms of hemorrhagic fever plus uh, epidemiology and history taking is most important to diagnose um, these guys as far as where you're going to find it, right? If I'm in Africa, I'm not going to be carrying around an RT-PCR or ELISA. Um, that's something that you're going to have in the United States. Um, so pretty much history is going to be able to diagnose this guy most importantly. So for Marburg, uh, the difference pretty much comes down to that there is a rash. <laughs> um, they wouldn't have you really pick between Marburg and Ebola unless they showed you a picture um, of the virus. So Ebola has this kind of long filamentous uh, shape like this. Marburg does not look like that at all. It's kind of bullet shaped. Um, it doesn't look like it uh, at all. Sometimes it's, it's longer and straight um, is what our Marburg virus looks like. Uh, but you can see bullae and vesicles uh, on the arms that you can find in this guy. Uh, you don't really see that in, in Ebola very, very commonly. Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Uh, this is found in Africa and the Balkans. Um, and it's carried by these weird ticks called hyloma ticks. Uh, pretty much uh, the weird thing is that you have photophobia, neck stiffness, similar to um, what you're going to find in um, like CNS infections, uh, such as like meningitis, right? Those are some of the presenting symptoms for meningitis. However, uh, it actually isn't due to um, the, the virus actually being there it, uh, itself. It actually is just due to bleeding into those areas that causes uh, those, those symptoms. Um, that you really don't need to know very high yield, but uh, as long as you've heard the name, you should be able to point out the, the tick, which is the hyaloma ticks. Rift Valley fe Fever. Um, this is uh, a segmented bunya virus. Um, you might have heard this in, uh, in Sketchy if you have watched this. It's found in Africa or places in Africa. Um, it's usually found associated with uh, infected animals. Uh, so veterinarians are the ones that are usually the ones that uh, pick this up. Um, it's usually asymptomatic but can involve um, your eyes, encephalitis, hemorrhagic fever, like uh, obviously this section is discussing. Um, so very small amount of patients actually go into hemorrhagic fever. It's usually permanent vision loss. This is one of the uh, common causes of uh, viral uh, vision loss. Other things are like CMV virus. Um, pretty much diagnosis with most of our viral infections are ELISA and PCR. Lassa fever is another thing I want to mention really quickly. This is one of your arena viruses. So in Sketchy, you will come across those arena viruses. Um, and this is segment this is negative single-stranded RNA virus. It's found in places like Nigeria and Guinea and Sierra Leone and Liberia, Ghana. Um, this is carried from a, a rat. Uh, so this is one of our viral infections from rats, which is similar to uh, our bunya viruses in the United States. Um, and you will come across those in our respiratory section, such as sin nombre virus of our bunya viruses. Um, and uh, pretty much what happens is the rats kind of colonize the homes and food storage areas, um, and they pretty much, uh, humans inhale, uh, you know, the, uh, the rat feces and stuff like that and get this virus. It can cause deafness and spontaneous abortions, uh, respiratory distress and hemorrhagic fevers, and then just bleeding from everywhere, um, uh, all over the place. So this is one of our severe hemorrhagic fevers uh, that is associated with rat transmission. Um, that's all you should really know about this guy. It's very, very low yield um, as far as all the viruses we're talking about, but it is still uh, a question that has come up on some of uh, the step exams. So now on to blood and lymphatic infections. Uh, these guys are actually really, really important. So definitely you should be able to um, be able to spot these on a stem uh, in addition to their differentials. Uh, and most importantly, malaria is very high yield. Not only the treatment, 
but also prophylaxis. Um, so we're going to kind of really dive into the details on these guys. So malaria, I'm sure from your lectures, you probably have uh, heard about these guys and studied a little bit about them. Let's make this make a little bit more sense. So uh, this is plasmodium species. It's a protozoal infection, uh, meaning it's a very small uh, organism that has a small cellular uh, organelles within them and uh, it's pretty much a single cell uh, multifunctional eukaryotic cell um, and uh, they have several uh, life stages that they can change into infective stages and uh, diagnostic stages and then they have defense mechanisms because the euka eukaryotic cells they have a lot of different things so that uh, they can survive it's carried from this anopheles mosquito which you can see up in the top right here uh, and it's always the females that bite. The males yeah, eat plants. Uh, so male, uh, female mosquitoes are always the one that, that bite us. Uh, it's a painless bite at night. Uh, and it's usually found, obviously, in Asia and Africa, Pacific and South America. Um, in the United States, it is not found. Um, but it is important because people travel to all these different areas and come back. And then they have the, the general symptoms that we're going to be talking about in just a second. The four types that we're going to be discussing are our... Um, Plasmodium malariae falciparum is the most important, vivax and ovale. So the symptoms, uh, how they uh, present, uh, and you definitely need to be able to recognize this right away on a stem so that you can continue with the question fast and save yourself some exam time. The most important thing that you can spot out in a malaria uh, infection is that they have this fever that repeats every day or every few days. Um, they have this cyclical fever where it goes spikes in fever and then it cools down uh, to a low, like, like non-existent fever, and then they sweat a ton. And then it goes back up, comes back down, sweat a ton, goes back up, comes back down, sweat, sweat a ton. This cyclical um, stage and repeating uh, is very, very kind of almost diagnostic of malaria, or at least pushes you to go, hmm, maybe I should look at their blood and see if they actually have malaria or ask them, have you been to Africa or India or Pacific or South America recently? Um, other things, you can see headaches and anemia, splenomegaly can show up, jaundice even because you're popping some of these cells, retinal hemorrhage is possible as well, and uh, some of these other guys can show up. Um, so pretty much the, the what you're going to see most commonly is an anemia with splenomegaly, fever repeating, and they feel ill. Those are the things that really point you, this person has malaria. They feel ill. The fevers repeat over and over. Maybe they're coming in on the sixth day and they said, oh, I had one three days ago. And then since then it hasn't been high. And now it's back up high again. Those sorts of things are really pointing, hmm, maybe they have malaria. So what do you do to diagnose? You can do a thick smear. Pretty much when you do a thick smear, you just say, are there spots inside RBCs, right? Are there little things inside RBCs. I don't know what it is and I don't care what it is inside right now. I just want to see, is this person infected possibly with something? Once I see a little spot or something inside my RBCs, then I do a thin smear to diagnose exactly what is in this RBC. Is it plasmodium malaria? Is it plasmodium falciparum, vivax, or ovale, or even uh, another infection entirely, Babesia, which we'll be covering in just a little bit. So um, how do we diagnose? What do they look like? So these trophozoites uh, is what we call kind of the feeding stage. So when these guys are floating around inside our RBCs, we call them trophozoites. And they form these little ring-shaped things. They almost look like, like a little bead, and then they form this ring, and then here's the RBC it's in. And so you might see one, or you might see two in there, and they have this little ring. It literally, it just looks like... Um, like a signet ring inside an RBC, right? We've talked about signet rings, I'm sure, in histology. You've, you've heard about them in, in regards to adipocytes and stuff like that. But this is just a ring inside an RBC. Um, and that's one of the diagnostic things for uh, malaria. Um, in addition, keep in mind that Babesia has those as well, but I'll be pointing out the difference. Um, they do not have cross structures. Um, it's just like these rings or like you're looking at the RBC and it has like a weird shape. We'll be discussing in just a second. Um, some of the RBCs can change um, like shape. So Vivax and Oval can sh change the size and shape. So they make like a very large RBC. So like Ovale makes them oval. That's why we call it Ovale. Um, in addition, you'll see these little spots 
all over in the cytosol. This is known as basophilic stippling, also known as Schuffner stippling, and that's a found uh, in associated with Vibax and Ovale. Um, those are the two that cause that basophilic stippling. Um, in, in regards to Vivax, what it looks like, it, it makes the RBC very large, but it's like square or abnormal shape. I'll be showing you those pictures in just a second. So let's talk about the life cycle of malaria. This is very important to know kind of the time frame of how these are organized, what you'll see at these different time frames, and then what are like the infective and diagnostic and um, possible spreading stages. So to start things off, the most important to understand is someone's infected with malaria and a mosquito comes and bites them. So we're going to start right here at the bottom. This mosquito comes and sucks out these gametocytes. So gametocytes are the ones that uh, get sucked up by this mosquito and they actually look like this in falciparum. They look like little bananas. Um, that's what these gametocytes are right here. They're little bananas found within RBCs. And um, the mosquito sucks it up and it changes throughout these stages that I really don't care about and neither should you. However, it gets to a point known as a sporozoite. This is after five days after they've developed and they develop into sporozoites in the mosquito. So this is five days, five days. They are now sporozoites. This is infective stage. This is the most important thing you should know as far as infection of malaria is that sporozoites are your infective stage. So a mosquito then flies over to another human and uh, starts drinking their blood and spitting out our sporozoites into this new person. Within about 30 minutes, it makes its way to the liver cells and stays there for a total of eight days. So five days, eight days, we are already at 13 days. 13 days from someone being bit to giving it to a new person, right? So that's 13 days um, to pretty much um, get to the point where we can start releasing our merozoites. So what are merozoites? Um, so pretty much merozoites are pieces um, of these uh, malarial protozoals that can go and infect RBCs. So in the liver cells, these kind of merozoites build up and build up into a kind of a bloated cell that's ready to pop. This is known as a exoerythrocytic schizont. Um, the way I kind of remember that, uh, what a schizont mean is just like an overfilling cell that's about to blow up. And so you're like, oh, schizont. And so um, a schizont is uh, just about to pop, right? So you're worried that it's going to pop and you're like, oh, schizont. Um, so that's your schizont. So once it pops open, these little merozoites fly out and they make them way over to RBCs. Once they get into RBCs, um, they replicate for a day and a half day and a half, they pop out and infect more cells for another day and a half. So two day and a halves equal three days. Um, and now we can then shuttle off into gametocytes and repeat the cycle. So the time frames are very important, um, knowing that it takes five days in a mosquito, eight days in the liver, three days in RBCs before we have more gametocytes to be picked up from mosquitoes. So this is kind of the total cycle right now. So I could ask you questions starting right here. Someone gets infected with sporozoites. How long will it take to present symptoms, one, or to be able to infect another person? Meaning how long will it take from being infected to come all the way back to being infected, uh, infecting another person? So if I were to ask you that question, when do sy symptoms present? Symptoms present after three days of our erythrocytic phase. So that means I get infected with sporozoites, I go eight days plus a day and a half plus another day and a half. And so that is on day 11, I present with symptoms. Day 11, symptoms. Day 11, symptoms, symptoms, day 11. At day 11, I can make gametocytes and get a, pick up another mosquito. And a, mosqui or a mosquito can pick these guys up takes five days and now they can reinfect someone. So day 11 is symptoms plus five more days, five more days, right? 16 days until someone can get reinfected with a sporozoite or with malaria. So careful. They will say someone just got infected with malaria. Someone just got infected with malaria. How long will it take for someone to 
another someone to be infected from this person? The answer is 16 days or more. You will probably have an answer choice of 15 days. Uh, that's pretty close to 16. However, will this person be infected on day 16? No, we will probably be at the oocyst phase and not the sporozyte phase uh, on day 15. So this person cannot be infected with an oocyte. So at that point, that answer would be incorrect. So look for questions or uh, answers that are 16 days or greater. So if it's 17, 18, 19, 20, those days, uh, it's now possible to be spitting sporozoites into a new human um, or a new person. So keep that in mind. Those time frames are very important. Understanding these stages are as well. So what are the species specifically? So uh, Plasmodium falciparum is the most important uh, one that you should definitely be knowing. In addition, one of the most highly yield uh, questions as far as treatment goes and epidemiology studies and all those things come into play. Um, it's the most dangerous as well, and that's why we emphasize it so much. Um, the, the fever cycle that it has, it repeats every single day. So I mentioned uh, before that we have that repeating fever, right? Fever, uh, no fever, chills, or, and sweating. Fever, chill, sweating, fever, chill, sweating. This occurs throughout a day, right? It could be every six hours or 12 hours that this cycle continues over and over and over. It goes up and down really, really fast. That's more commonly found with falciparum. This guy can also involve the, the cerebral vasculature. It sticks to it. And that causes obstruction and decreased blood supply to the brain. And that causes cerebral malaria. So it could be hypoxia, uh, unconsciousness, coma, and death that can be coming from this guy. Uh, it does not have hypnozoites. And you're probably going, what on earth is a hypnozoite? So a hypnozoite is kind of this uh, bleed off phase from sh schizons. So uh, liver uh, replicates our guys for eight days, but then they kind of get stuck. They go into this dormant uh, phase. This is called... Um, uh, our dormant phase, sorry, this is a, a D dormant. Um, this is known as a hypnozoite. I don't know what I'm writing there. <laughs> hypnozoite. Uh, and this is kind of the dormant phase from our liver stage. So um, that is only found in Vivax and Oval. Uh, and so your falciparum does not have hypnozoite. And we call that exoerythrocytic or outside blood which is really stupid why we refer to that, but that's what it's called. Uh, also can cross the placenta, infect in baby. And uh, there's this high drug resistance around the wall, especially to chloroquine, which is our number one treatment for malaria. Um, but there's a lot of resistance to it. So we have to use a lot of different drugs. This is how we look at it on uh, um, blood uh, smears. So this is a thin smear and we can see our RBCs up here. And you see these little rings. See, here's the little signet part right there um, with the little ring in them. And I don't see any crosses. It's only ring structures found within here. The RBCs are normal size and normal shape. Um, and so this most likely is falciparum. Uh, and that's uh, how I can diagnose that one. Where Vivax and Oval, remember I mentioned they increase the size of the RBC and they make weird things and they have that stippling. You can definitely see those with those two pictures right there. These two actually can form the dormant stage in the liver. This is known as a hypnozoite. And how we treat that uh, hypnozoite is we give them primaquine. So chloroquine can clear all the blood uh, stages of this guy, uh, but hypnozoites is this dormant and it can re uh, appear. And so we can treat the blood stages of someone that has Vivax. And they'll be like, oh, I feel great. I'm totally fine. And then two weeks later, they start showing symptoms again, right? We give them chloroquine. It goes away and they're like, I feel fine. And then two weeks again, they start showing it. It's like, hmm, maybe they have Vivax or Val. Give them Primaquine. It kills the dormant stage in the liver and there's no more reoccurrence of this. Uh, the stage of fever is every three days it has that. So, you know, third and sixth day, um, they have that fever recurring. Um, just like uh, we talked about as well. The oval shape and the Vivax, I just, uh, I looked up what Vivax meant and it meant something else. So I'm just going to say Vivax means odd shaped uh, and enlarged. So it's odd shaped, it has these weird things in it, and it's got that stippling. Uh, see how it's very large? That's our P Vivax. In oval, we see an oval shape, we see the stippling, and it's enlarged. I have ovale. That's how I can diagnose those guys, plus the fever. Uh, possible recurrence.
give Prime a queen, and that gets rid of that. Um, Malaria is the last guy that you should be knowing. Um, it presents similar to Vivax and Vival, except the fever occurs every fourth day. There's no hypnozoites for this guy or exoerythrocytic stages. And they're kind of diagnostic on this band-shaped thing. So you see this band going across the RBC. That's P. malariae. In addition, you can see uh, these weird little um, rosette chizonts uh, in the RBC. So this is what like the chizonts look like. Uh, in these guys and they're ready to um, to pop out of there. Oh, shy aunt. Yep. Okay. So a little bit about treatment. I'm not going to go too much into detail. This is a great chart to explain um, how to treat malaria. Uh, malaria. Um, I just want to emphasize kind of you have discussed adverse effects and some of the important drugs, right? So if you have uncomplicated, unresistant um, malaria, just go for chloroquine. That's your answer. However, if you have some sort of resistance, you want to jump it up to something a little bit better. So look for um, one of these guys here. If it's Vivax or Val, uh, remember they can have hypnozoites hidden in the liver. So you got to get them, get rid of them with primaquine. Primaquine is going to get rid of that Vivax and Oval hypnozoites. Um, <clears throat> If there's super resistant stages of any of these guys, uh, you can give quinine or quinidine. Um, this is kind of an antiarrhythmic drug, but we found out that it actually kills off um, these guys. Uh, but pretty much the, the really resistant guys, you can give quinine. That's our kind of go-to last possible drug. When it comes to prophylaxis, on the other hand, um, <clears throat> or uh, I'm sorry, in pregnancy, we can actually give chloroquine. So that's the best drug. If they have ova ovale or Vivax, do not give them primaquine until they deliver the baby. Then you can give them primaquine. Um, in addition, uh, mefloquine is one of the best prof prophylaxis for pregnant women. This is one of the best guys for that. Um, <clears throat> they mentioned in your lectures, and it's not necessarily true, um, but uh, malarone, this is also known as atavoquone and proguanil. Um, this is the, these are the best prophylaxis overall out of everything, right? So mefloquine is the best for pregnancy and it's cheap, um, but overall best prophylaxis for everything is known as malarone. Um, but knowing malarone is, is not enough. You actually need to know that it's atavoquone and proguanil. Um, just pronounce it with an accent or something like that. Atavoquone and proguanil. Um, that's how I remember that those guys are the best at prophylaxis. Um, so again, uncomplicated, go for chloroquine. If she's pregnant, go for chloroquine. If it's resistant, pregnant, go for mefloquine. If it's super, super resistant to everything, go quinine. Best prophylaxis, atavoquone, proguanil. That's pretty much all you should know. This uh, chart uh, should come in handy when you get to um, pharmacology in term five for these guys. Um, but, uh, I just kind of wanted to put a little bit, uh, spin on what's emphasized important from this guy. So now on to, uh, the last few of our infections, as far as the blood, um, Babesia is another guy that comes up. He presents very similar to, uh, malaria, except this is actually found in the United States. So malaria is not found in the United States. But this is. This uh, is carried uh, in the northeast United States by the Exodes tick, also known as Exodes scapularis. So if you were to say, where is Exodes scapularis um, uh, tick found, um, which is this little guy up here, right? This is our Exodes tick. Um, you can say, oh, well, he's found in the scapula <laughs> of the United States. And you go, what do you, what do you mean, scapula of the United States? Well, don't you see that? I see a scapula right here, right? There's a scapula of the United States. Um, that is where we actually find this. So the Northeast United States is where we find Babesia. And it also makes sense because most, actually a lot of students I, I've met actually know that um, Lyme disease is um, found in the Northeast United States. And isn't that weird that this is the same tick that carries Lyme disease, also known as Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, you will, we will be coming across this infection in our multi-system, so don't worry about that guy right now. Um, I just want to emphasize that Babesia is another blood infection that looks like malaria, but um, in a stem, if they're wanting to pick out Babesia, this person has not traveled to anywhere you're going to get malaria. They probably live in the north 
East United States, Massachusetts, Maine, those sorts of places. Um, and uh, have symptoms of fever and chills, malaise, uh, anemia. Uh, one weird thing about this is you can find coarse lung crackle, so it causes pulmonary edema. Uh, ARDS is possible with this as well. And then one other thing is splenomegaly, which we saw that in malaria as well. And that can decrease your RBCs, causing anemia, and platelets, which can cause bleeding uh, via the sequestration process. Um, differentials, like I mentioned, is malaria, except... Uh, Babesia doesn't have recurring cycling fevers. This person's going to be feverish the entire time. They're going to feel terrible. They're going to have lung crackles, enlarged spleen. They live in the northeast United States. And then on peripheral smear, we don't only have just ring um, RBCs, right? Our ring RBCs we saw in malaria. But we also see these cross-shaped, also known as uh, our Maltese cross intraerythrocytic inclusions. So you can see this kind of uh, cross being formed uh, right up here. And, and this guy right here, this is our Maltese cross uh, found in RBCs. That, bam, is Babesia. That's how we diagnose this guy. Um, I put up a couple of the species names. I really don't think they're that important. Uh, just recognizing Babesia uh, is, is the important part. Uh, now on to our lymphatic infection. So Workaria bancrofti is... Uh, Pretty much, uh, you have probably have heard about this guy. This is known as lymphatic filariasis. Um, this is found in Africa and India and Asia. And uh, it's transmitted into a human at the stage of L3 larva. That is actually really important to know that the L3 larva is the one that is infective stage. The diagnostic is an L1 uh, in a thick blood smear at night. Or we can just simply do uh, this new test we created known as the female antigen test or immunochromographic uh, test, uh, which is the gold standard nowadays. We don't have to do it at night. And you might be asking, why at night? What do you mean by this? So uh, in basic microbiology, you might have heard about... Um, some organisms that only come out into the peripheral blood so that we can actually detect them at certain times of day. Um, and this is probably because these organisms recognize that we were only being picked up by mosquitoes that were biting at night. Therefore, why would I be putting myself flying around in the blood, being able to be picked up by my uh, this person's immune system and killed off? Uh, instead, I want to spend my energy to kind of secrete out my babies into the blood so that they can be picked up only when they're being these people are being bit by mosquitoes at night. So uh, diagnostic for this guy used to occur only at night. During the day, we weren't able to detect it because the worm wasn't secreting out its eggs into the blood or this uh, L1 larva, I mean. And so um, that's kind of this weird phenomenon that occurs with Workaria bancrofti. Um, so what is the disease that it causes? It can cause chyluria or lymph in the urine, uh, hydrocele in men, and then uh, more commonly the lymphatic filariasis. It just goes up, hangs out in the lymph system and causes obstruction, lymphedema. And then eventually that swelling into the tissues can cause chronic inflammation. And then we can have fungal and bacterial infections on top of this. This is known as recurrent filarial fevers. If we wanted to treat this person's filarial fevers, we just treat those bacteria and fungi instead of the actual worm itself. Um, and eventually, after a long amount of chronic inflammation, this leads to elephantiasis. I really didn't want a picture of that because it's kind of gross. Um, but uh, I'm sure you are dr uh, traumatized from what elephantiasis looks like. Um, so that uh, is something that uh, we can s stop if we treat this worm right away that if this person has it um, uh, in addition there's some important information as far as how we can actually treat this so uh, this weird thing uh, this organism this gram negative bacteria uh, known as wolbachia actually lives inside this worm so you can see these little spots over here in the worm um, inside there that is actually Wolbachia itself um, and these guys what they do is they help this worm um, undergo like sexual reproduction and without those bacteria being present um, there's no longer uh, an ability for this worm to replicate and so um, if we can kill off those bacteria we now make a sterile worm and then it, once this worm dies then we stop the disease. Wolbachia is also found in another organism, Oncocerco volvulus. And uh, when you guys see that guy in multi-systems, uh, you will be able to see its little spots. It looks like a leopard worm. Uh, and that's also Wolbachia found within that as well. 
Um, and so the treatment is driv driven towards uh, a few things. For filarial fevers, again, bacterial and fungal treatments, right? Like topical fun fungal um, fun fungicides or bacterial antibacterials. Um, if we want to kill the Wolbachia itself, we give doxycycline. If you want to kill the worm itself, it's diethylcarbamazine or DEC or DEC. Um, and so the way I kind of remember this, uh, my friend kind of came up with this. It was actually really good. Um, there's two uh, worms. There's another worm. It's called the eye worm or wormy worm is what loa loa means. It's just some other worm. You'll learn about it uh, in our multi-systems as well. Um, but Loa Loa and this worm, uh, Workaria bancrofti, are both targeted by the drug diethylcarbamazine. They're the only two worms that we really treat using diethylcarbamazine or DEC, right? So if you can just think DEC the halls with Loa Loa, fa la la la, lariasis, then you can remember that Loa Loa and filariasis or lymphatic filariasis, as we have here, are both treated by DEC or diethylcarbamazine. Um, that's going to definitely help you with, uh, with pharmacology for those guys. Um, and again, I, I want to emphasize this for the third time, recurrent filarial fevers, bacterial and antifungals. Do not miss that free point. All right, so let's go ahead and continue into the last section that we have, and that is cardiovascular microbiology. I'm aware that some of the subjects have been rearranged. Uh, this is just the completion of my microbiology modules. Um, however, this is actual the first module that you're going to be covering as far as microbiology is cardiovascular system and how that affects uh, the populace of our in our hospitals and uh, those out in the community as well. So without further ado, uh, the first thing in how you approach cardio, this is actually one of the easiest sections that it's taught the worst. Um, and so how about I teach you better um, so that you can learn to approach these questions. So uh, the first thing you kind of want to look for in a stem that's leaning for cardiovascular uh, infections, such as endocarditis, for example, are your risk factors. Those really give you the, the exact diagnosis. Um, so pretty much it's going to be someone that comes in um, so let's, let's use this example right down here. We have a 50 year old man that comes in and presents, presents with two days of fever at 103 Fahrenheit. This means this person is probably ill with some sort of infection. We don't know what it is. Um, however, once we uh, get past the fever, he's fatigued and malaise. So this is probably something to do with either the GI tract, he's losing fluids or something to do with blood or possibly heart. We've now kind of narrowed down our differentials as those usually the things um, that involve these sort of symptoms right here. It still could be a respiratory infection, it still could be other things, but just based on that right there. So once person comes in, he's complaining of that, I get my stethoscope out and I listen, I hear a new murmur. Um, this is one that has not been present in the last patient's visit. So at that point, I have this kind of this person feels ill, he has a fever, he's tired, and there's a new murmur. At that point right there, being that he's 50 years old, it screams to me he has some sort of infection in his heart or in the cardiovascular system. Most likely at this point, since there's a murmur, it's most likely the heart being more specific, and that is probably endocarditis. That stem base right there screams to me. So again, uh, the first thing is you want to know your risk factors, which we're going to be going over. Don't worry, we'll get there. Um, plus the basic stem that they usually present, trying to say this is endocarditis. You put the risk factor plus the basic symptoms in the stem. You have your diagnosis and you continue answering just whatever the specific question, question is look like, looking for. Being that you're in microbiology, they usually like to ask you detailed things about the organism that is most likely causing this person's infection. And so that kind of comes down to what is the most likely organism uh, for each of the risk factor types. So that's why, again, risk factors are very, very important for this. So the first things that you kind of can do if you want to break down and study uh, endocarditis is you can break it down sort of like how you most likely have learned it in lecture. And I'm going to kind of do that a little bit, but really focus on those risk factors um, so that you can really pick out the correct organism for it. 
However, uh, how we do that, I don't want to just leave that blank there, um, is you can classify it via like acute versus subacute. Um, you can base it just on the risk factors themselves, such as someone that has dental procedure or they're an IV drug user or some old person with colon cancer or they had recent GI surgery or prosthetic valve. Um, and those kind of things are what you can organize, what is the most likely organism for it. And I'll show you how, how we go ahead and do this. So for infective endocarditis, before we do those, I kind of want to do, what is it, right? Um, sure, in, it's infective and it's in the endocardium, um, but what does that exactly mean, right? Our heart is um, constantly circulating blood, so how on earth is something sticking to the inside of the heart? Well, uh, it kind of comes down to the specific organisms that can cause this. Not every organism can actually cause this. So there's kind of special things about each of the ones that do. So usually when we're talking about this, we're usually not talking about like the ventricle wall necessarily. We're usually talking about valves. Valves are the most uh, commonly associated things in, re in regards to infective endocarditis. Uh, if you're on the left side of the heart, it's usually um, things... Uh, such as strep, for example, strep coming from plaque in your teeth. So if you ever heard of someone like, oh, if you don't clean your teeth or brush your teeth or floss your teeth, um, that plaque can make its way to your heart. Um, what I used to think that was as a kid was thinking, uh, you know, old people have blood clot or um, atherosclerosis, right? I might have heard of that and I didn't know exactly what it was, but I thought that that plaque actually came from your teeth. So that kind of scared me into brushing my teeth as a kid. Um, it wasn't the reason or the argument my parents had to me uh, when I was a kid, like, you better brush your teeth or you're going to have atherosclerosis. No, they never said that because um, I didn't actually, actually know what that was. But uh, growing up, learning a little bit more about science, that's what I thought. I thought that plaque from your teeth led to atherosclerosis plaques. Um, but that's not necessarily true at all, actually. Uh, it's the plaque of your teeth or organisms, especially strep, like mitis. It's your viridins group. And uh, strep viridins group, once it gets, if it can get into the blood, if there's some sort of underlying damage or something it can stick to, it will. And so it makes plaques, um, or also known as um, aggregations of these colonies growing on the uh, endocardium or on the valves and this is known as infective endocarditis. Um, if it's on the left side again it's usually strep. Uh, the exception is staph endocarditis and that is usually on the right side of the heart and that's tricuspid and it's associated with IV drug use. If you have someone with that basic stem of uh, something that's screaming to you this person most likely has infective endocarditis and it is on the right side of the heart, just pick staph, done. You don't need to pick anything else unless they tell you a lab result, like we did a culture and it grew like this and those results say it's not staph. If, if that is what actually is added into the stem, um, if that isn't in the stem, just pick staph. But if something else says, oh, it's actually strep for some weird reason on the right side of the heart, then obviously pick strep, um, but if in particular, uh, they don't give you labs and they just say it's on the right side of the heart, IV drug user, done. That's staph, staph aureus in specific. So uh, the two types of endocarditis we can talk about is acute versus subacute. So in that stem before, high fever, uh, feeling of illness, new murmur, that's acute, especially if it's acute onset, like, oh, he's only had it for three or four days, he's been feeling real ill. Uh, the key feature here, though, is high fever uh, and new auscultation. It usually occurs within a couple days. Where subacute endocarditis, usually uh, this person has previously abnormal valve, um, some sort of um, other risk factors we're going to be talking about in just a second. Uh, usually low virulence things, so they're going to have really like a low feel fever. It's going to last a few weeks and they'll be feeling ill um, and, and stuff like that. So uh, again, for endocarditis, it's got to meet the Duke criteria, which we'll talk about, um, and kind of the symptoms that come along with that. As far as risk factors go, uh, there are particular ones and they're associated with particular organisms. So we'll go ahead and kind of um, talk about these guys, um, or, or a few of them at least. So uh, when we're talking about mitral, uh, like risk factors for already damaged heart. Um, so in the United States versus in the uh, throughout the world, there is a difference. So usually what ha has to happen for infective endocarditis and the most common um, 
uh, presentation of infective endocarditis is usually the subacute endocarditis this is the most common and how it presents is usually someone that has a recent dental procedure so they just uh, got a tooth extracted they got a crown on something that leads to a little bit of bleeding in the mouth and letting some of that strep organism kind of leak in there make its way in circulation make its way to the heart but again, like I said, there has to be some sort of underlying damage. So what is that underlying damage depends on where you are. If the stem simply says, you know, a 35-year-old woman that comes in, something like that, and doesn't say that she ever uh, lived out of the United States, then we're assuming she's from the United States. And my most underlying cause and pre-exposure damage to the heart or a valve of a native valve would be mitral valve prolapse. So if I were just left with a basic stem from someone we're assuming is from the United States and they have subacute endocarditis, especially on the left side of the heart, I'm assuming this person has mitral valve prolapse. It is the most common cause of underlying basic uh, pre-infective um, endocarditis heart damage that we already have. So it's just kind of, uh, it's now opened up a nice field that we can grow all our bacteria on, our damaged field sort of, is what our mitral valve prolapse comes with. Now, if we're talking about in the world, especially outside of the US, if someone's coming from India or Africa or something like that, um, strep pyogenes or strep throat, as you might know it as, is a very common infection. Uh, they're, not very, they're not treated very well in a, a lot of these countries. And so um, this leads to rheumatic heart disease, which you probably have heard about in PATH and studied. And at this point, you should know a lot about this. So this pre-exposes or damages valves, especially the mitral valve, um, on, uh, on the left side of the heart uh, for, uh, are the most common uh, locations. And so rheumatic heart disease is the most common around the world, um, especially outside of the United States, that damages native heart valves, allowing for strep viridens group to come in. And uh, viridens is also the one that comes up on mitral valve prolapse. So strep viridens, right? And uh, how I would describe that is a catalase negative organism. Uh, we will be describing each of these individually. Um, now, other things can lead to damage to your heart valves. Uh, obviously, really, really, really old people can have calcified, like aortic stenosis or calcified valves, and that can lead to this as well. Um, that's less uh, common, and you're probably not going to get a question involving that. So look for really um, rheum rheumatic heart disease for someone that's an immigrant or mitral val valve prolapse for someone from the United States. Other things are prosthetic heart valves. We'll be talking about those in just a little bit. This is associated with staph epidermidis infection. So this is uh, something that when we put in a new valve, we give them staph, um, uh, especially epidermidis. It comes off the, the surgeon's arm, makes its way onto the valve, and then we install it. We start up their heart and we go, have a nice day. Three weeks later, the patient comes in feeling ill, low fever, a new murmur on auscultation, and they meet the Duke criteria. They have subacute endocarditis. We just put in a prosthetic heart valve. What is the most likely organism? That is staph epidermidis. That's how we describe that one uh, is the most likely. IV drug use, like we said, it's usually the right side of the heart um, associated with staph aureus. Um, and then anything that can lead to bacteria in here. So cuts, surgeries, dental procedures, all these things. Um, obviously, I can't have infective endocarditis without the actual bacteria <laughs> or the organism doing it. So if I don't have bacteria floating around the blood, they're never going to make it to the heart in order to cause infective endocarditis. So I have to have some sort of transient bacteremia. So look for surgery or dental procedures recently um, or IV drug use. Those are the things that we're usually talking about uh, for an infective endocarditis question. Other things, a very rare case. Um, and this comes up actually in our multi-systems thing. So uh, keep an eye out for, for that when we're talking about zoonotic infections. Uh, but if you have like a farmer, a rancher, a butcher, or something like that is associated with animals or cutting them up, um, then it could be Coxiella burnetti. Um, again, this is very low yield as far as your cardiovascular stuff right now. Uh, but when you get to multi-systems, it actually comes up to very high yield because it is the most common cause of zoonotic disease to affect the heart. Um, but uh, I just want to mention it here now, so this name will, will ring a bell when we get to multi-systems. 
So uh, a little bit more about infective endocarditis. So if we were kind of to break down these guys, now I want to associate a particular risk factor with the organism. So this is how questions are going to go. They're going to give you that basic stem was we described. You're going to go, this is infective endocarditis. At this point, you now have to go, what is the risk factor for this question? And they're only going to give you one. They're not going to say this person has a prosthetic uh, valve, IV drug use, dental procedures, colon cancer, and GI um, procedures as well. They're not going to give you all five of these because that would be an impossible thing unless they gave you lab results. Um, so I'm going to give you both. So if I have a prosthetic valve, I mentioned that this is Staphylococcus epidermidis. And how do I describe this? So remember our staphs versus our streps, that uh, our staphs are catalase positive. Uh, our staph aureus is the only one that is coagulase positive, so epidermis would be coagulase negative. And how do I separate epidermis from saprophyticus? I have to do one additional test. This is my novobiosin sensitivity. It's an antibiotic I've put in my media. If it grows, then it is resistant. If it doesn't grow, that means it's sensitive and dies because of the novobiosin antibiotic. And just keep in mind that your epidermis is very sensitive, right? Your skin is very sensitive. And so I know that staph epidermidis is sensitive to novobiosin. How I remember the opposite, the one that is resistant to novobiosin, is saprosistant. So this is staph saprophyticus is saprosistant. That's how I remember that guy. But for prosthetic valves, staph uh, epidermidis, Catalase positive, coagulase negative, novobiosin sensitive, and um, uh, other things that can cause infections on prosthetic valves are gram negative bacilli, but uh, don't worry about those too much. I just have to put it there because it, it is sort of important and you can possibly get a question on that, um, but very unlikely. They usually want to, to point out uh, epidermis. So that's prosthetic heart valves. Now, for someone that has IV drug use, uh, I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, but. Uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus or Staph aureus. Um, this usually is acute, so this person's going to have a high fever. It's going to be quick onset, and it's usually associated with a tricuspid native valve. So we haven't done anything to the valve. It's totally fine. I could get Staph aureus infective endocarditis. My heart is totally fine uh, if I were to do IV drug use, right? And I can increase the risk of getting this guy. This is, uh, as you know, Staph aureus and some of the other big uh, organisms. These guys are very pathogenic. So they don't even need a damaged heart valve or di damaged tricuspid valve. They just need to be flying around in the blood. So that's all that they require in order to cause this. So it can be a totally sharp baby heart that could be infected with staphylococcus. Hopefully that baby is not doing IV drug use. Um, but anyways, uh, dental procedures is the next guy. So dental procedures I mentioned is your Virden's group. So you want to actually be able to recognize some of the basic organism species names. So S. mutans and S. mitis, um, that is actually more high yield than just being able to separate uh, viridins. Um, actually knowing the species names is very important um, because you have to pick them from some of the organisms and you're just going to be like, what is S. mutans? I've never seen that in my life. Unless you now listen to me right now saying you actually do need to know this. Usually associated with subacute uh, on a native valve, but one that is damaged. So someone that's like really old, rheumatic heart disease or mitral valve prolapse. Remember what I just mentioned on the previous slide. If I were to describe this group of organisms, there are particular things you should know. One thing is, uh, if I were to ask you a question, I have this person who just did a dental procedure and they have endocarditis. The organism most likely to cause this produces what in order for it to actually stick or to bind to the surface of the valves and the endocardium. At that point, your answer should be this. Something associated with biofilms, and those things associated with biofilms are known as dextrans. They take sucrose and glucose, break them down, rebuild them as dextrans, and that adds kind of a sticky. So if you can take a little bit of sugar and you get a little bit wet and then let it dry, it gets really, really sticky. This is kind of what uh, these guys do on their surface. They break down sucrose and glucose. Uh, they wet it down almost like that and then stick it on their surface. Now they're kind of sticky. So when they fly around in the blood, they can stick to exposed or damaged heart valves. Um, and that's exactly what they do. 
uh, not only on the heart, but actually how it gets on your teeth. So you might be wondering uh, why plaque is kind of hard to scrape off and why you need to go to the dentist every six months so that they can scrape off these biofilms is because these guys produce dextrans. Um, they use the, the sucrose and glucose that you ingest uh, in order for them to grow and stick to your teeth. And that's why they grow so fast and why it's you can get all that plaque by the end of the day and stuff like that, which is gross. Anyways, how do we describe the Virden's group? So strep, remember, versus staph. Strep are catalase negative. Um, this one in particular is a group found within your alpha hemolytics. The other alpha hemolytic is something that has a capsule and it is your um, diplococci, lancet shaped. I'm sure uh, those kind of names might come up uh, again and again in respiratory. You're never gonna hear the end of this guy. This is known as your strep pneumo. Um, but this guy in particular is alpha hemolytic and has no capsule, unlike strep pneumo. And then this is optochin resistant. So it will grow on optochin auger, where um, strep pneumo, on the other hand, has a capsule. And that's what we make the vaccine for, right? Our vaccine is the capsule antigen, and uh, it is optochin sensitive. Uh, if you watch Sketchy, uh, you'll get that kind of locked in there. If someone has colon cancer, or if they give you the diagnosis, this person has infective endocarditis with strep gallolyticus, also known as strep bovis for butt cancer. Uh, this is your colon cancer is what you want to be looking for. This is actually super high yield to know. Um, it's very interesting. It's, it's very rare that this happens. Um, but if someone has infective endocarditis and they give you the diagnosis of gallolyticus, also known, it used to be known as strep bovis, um, with these guys, uh, you have to know um, that there's some sort of underlying colon cancer, and you got to be looking for that. So they could actually ask you, what do we, what should we be looking for if someone has this? And that's uh, do an endoscopy, all right? Do a colonoscopy in order to see if they have colon cancer or some sort of can um, cancer in their GI tract. Um, that that has the same labs as enterococcus, is, except it doesn't grow on NACL, and we're going to be describing that right now. So if someone has GI procedures, right? We talked about GI cancer particularly. Um, this is actually GI procedure. So someone has appendicitis, or they have a tumor, and we go in for surgery to actually cut it out. Right? We're actually cutting the GI tract open, and then uh, sealing it back up. That exposes the person to group D strep. Uh, also known as enterococci. And so uh, the way I remember this is catalase negative. It's uh, gamma hemolytic uh, along with your bovis, right? Both of these guys are gamma hemolytic. And with that, the differentiating factor is that your enterococci or group D strep can grow on NACL and bile, where uh, butt cancer can only grow on b -b 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 bile uh, and not on salt auger. And that's how I just kind of organized risk factor to disorder. And this is how your questions are going to be showing up. Person has endocarditis, recent dental procedure. They had strep throat multiple times as a kid, and they have had a murmur in their heart for a while. Now they have a new one. What is, what's the problem? At that point, I know they have rheumatic heart disease, so their heart was already set up to kind of capture um, anything that's floating around in the blood. And this person just had a dental procedure was my risk factor. Put those things together, strep viridens, be looking for mutans or mitis. Those uh, is pretty how straightforward these questions are. There's no weird organization that you need to do. If you just follow this, um, you'll be able to answer these questions. So, uh, We've already talked about, you know, there's abnormal blood flow due to some sort of damage in the endothelial uh, lining or the blood flow changes the endothelial lining. Some Somewhere along the lines, these guys occur first. And that allows for um, the binding of via fibronectin of these organisms, uh, especially Virden's group. They use um, dextrans to bind that fibronectin. Um, and at that point, that is where we have infective endocarditis. Now, symptoms that come along. There's uh, specific things that you need to kind of organize, and I'm actually giving you a head start on your pathophysiology, and this should get you a question in term five in regards to your pathophysiology exam, uh, but this is something you should know even for step. So I'm going to teach it to you now. You're going to learn it again in term five. When you get to step studying, you'll go over it again, and then when you get to step, you'll get that question on, on the exam uh, correct as well. So I want to get, get you the exposure of this. So 
with infective endocarditis, there are all, the, all these different things. We already talked about fever, so let's cross that off. Leaving us left with these other random things. We talked about new murmur, especially regurgitant murmurs. So let's go ahead and cross that off. And that leaves us with these other things. Janeway lesions, ocellar nodes, uh, splinter hemorrhages, anemia, and raw spots. So what are these things and how do I describe them? And what is the organization of them? So Janeway lesions, um, I just remember that Jane wouldn't hurt anybody. And so these are non-tender. Non-tender, they're very small vascular lesions uh, and they're hemorrhagic. So pretty much what happens is there's some sort of embolization and that cuts off blood supply. There's necrosis behind it. And then we reperfuse. This leads to a small non-tender hemorrhagic lesion. It usually is in the palms and soles of the feet. Um, so if I were to ask you, what are the infections that lead to um, uh, a rash or something showing up on the, the palms and soles, you have to add an infective endocarditis onto your differentials. And when you guys get to skin, you'll learn all the other guys. There's only a few, which is good. Uh, this kind of really narrows down to pretty much four options to pick from that lead to uh, palms and soles involved. So if you see those four things, be thinking of infective endocarditis. When you get to skin, you'll learn of the other three. But as for now, uh, now for your first uh, exam, this is great. You see palms uh, and soles. You know you're talking about Janeway lesions. That's infective endocarditis. Now, Osler nodes. Um, these guys are O of Osler for ouch. They're very painful. This is immunological response. It's red, raised lesions in the hands and feet. Um, and this is immune complex deposition. So Jane wouldn't hurt anybody, non-tender. Osler nodes. This is painful, ouch, of Osler. Um, and uh, this is due to immune complex deposition. So immune response is responding. There's swelling and redness. Um, and so associated pain would be coming with that. Splinter hemorrhages. This is a vascular, obviously. Um, we have some sort of um, necrosis occurring under the nail bed. Then we uh, reperfuse, and that leads to a little bit of hemorrhage. Uh, anemia can occur. So if I have these valves kind of sitting out in the path of where my blood is usually laminarly flowing smoothly through uh, across these valves, if something's in the way, I have a turbulent flow and the blood cells can shear off these valves and that can lead to anemia. Other things of raw spots, so R of raw spots is what you're going to find in the retina. And again, this is immunological. So if I were to say, what are the vascular lesions? We're going to be talking about Janeway and splinter hemorrhages. If we're talking about immunological, you're going to be thinking about retina and uh, spe specifically the painful ones on your hands and feet called Osler nodes. Um, this is very important to know which ones are vascular versus which ones are immunological and be able to recognize uh, which of these. And that's pretty much uh, part of the main uh, purpose of your diagnosis of the do criteria. So do criteria kind of checklists. Oh yeah, he's got this and this and this new murmur, um, right? And a fever and he has a risk factor for it. Bam, this guy has infective endocarditis. It's just kind of a diagnostic criteria. Um, but all these uh, things or may maybe one or two of these things can actually show up in the stems as well, giving you extra support for your diagnosis. So uh, this last kind of group is really weird. Um, I don't like these guys, um, but there are a few things you should know, and I pretty much shortened them so you don't really have to study a lot. So uh, your HASIC group, these are your culture negatives. So if I draw at someone's blood and they have infective endocarditis, nothing will grow on any of my augers. So you're, you're probably asking me, how do I know this? Well, I can still do other tests and run other tests on them. Um, now, uh, keep in mind, there are some ways that we can actually grow them. Uh, what this culture negative just means is it doesn't grow on the normal um, normal augers that we, uh, we usually test with. Um, there are special ones for this organism, right? This is aggregatobacter. Uh, these guys grow cigar-shaped colonies. And the way I just remember uh, the diagnostic for these, uh, pretty much these two are the only ones you really need to know. Iconella and Kingella, I don't know anything about them, and neither should you. Just know that they're gram-negative uh, organisms. Homophilus as well, but that usually comes into respiratory infections. So as far as the heart, aggregator bacterium and cardiobacterium uh, are the ones that you really will need to focus on and be able to differentiate a, 
amongst them. And so the best way to do this is uh, I just remember aggregators eat cats. And so therefore aggregator bacter, aggregator bacter is catalase positive. Uh, this guy does produce this cytal lethal distending toxin and that allows for biofilm formation. So same thing that we kind of talked about in regards to strep viridin's group making those dextrons, allowing it to bind. This guy uses something else called cytolethal distending toxin. Uh, and remember that aggregator bacters, um, aggregati, are, eat cats, and so therefore they're catalyzed positive. Where cardiobacterium, I just remember aerobic exercise is good for the cardio. Ha <laughs> ha, cardiobacterium is oxidase positive, right? Because aerobic oxygen. Uh, and so these guys will be oxidase oxidase positive, catalase negative, where these ones will be uh, catalase positive, oxida um, oxidase negative. Um, that's pretty much all you need to know about those guys. So lastly are the few other infections involving the heart. We've already talked all this stuff so far have been endocarditis. So let's go ahead and talk about the other types of carditis. Pericarditis, we're gonna knock out first because this is pretty much the easiest. Um, person comes in with pleuritic chest pain and you might be going, I don't know what that is, unless you already do know what that is. Uh, let me explain. Uh, this is someone that is like super sharp pain, like chest pain, uh, but it's very localized where someone that has chest pain, like a heart attack, they're gonna have like preferred squeezing, uh, compression. It's almost like someone sitting on their chest pain that can radiate to their jaw or the left arm. This person has sharp pain. It's like where their heart is, right behind the lung. They feel it like stabbing right there. That is pleuritic chest pain. If I were to take my um, stethoscope and put it on their chest over their heart, uh, I would hear a friction rub. It's just like, that's what it sounds like. Um, and so uh, when this person leans forward, um, the pain is kind of relieved. So I just imagine, um, actually, I'm going to draw a beautiful heart. This is my wonderful heart. Here's the heart and here's the chest wall, right? So I have this space in between here and I have like a pericardial sac around here. So here's my pericardial sac. Here's my chest wall. So um, this person is experiencing pain when the heart has to swing forward, bam, and smack into the heart wall. So can you imagine them accelerating into a wall? So if you start a mile away from a wall and accelerate in a car and hit the wall, will you be hitting it harder than if you were to start an inch away from the wall and accelerating? Well, obviously, if you're an inch away, you only have to travel this, you're not going to accelerate very fast. You're going to get to... Um, maybe half a mile an hour and bam, you hit the wall. So how painful is that? Well, not at all. You didn't do anything. Now, if you're a whole, you know, a mile or half a mile away and you accelerate, you're gonna be at 60 miles an hour and smash, crash. So this person with pleuritic chest pain, when they lean forward, their heart is closer to the surface uh, of their chest wall or their lungs, the pleural cavity, something like whatever is in front of the heart, uh, or the anterior mediastinum, it's now closer. So it, when it beats, it doesn't smack into the anterior uh, heart wall. So that's why the person leans forward. If they lay back, right, or if they're laying on their back, right, their heart has to beat and swing, bam, and bam, and has to hit the anterior wall as if they started their car and accelerated from a mile away to drive into the um, chest wall. So that is why this person has sharp pain, but also um, why it's better when they lean forward. That is a key finding that you'll find in stems when they're describing pleuritic chest pain plus the friction rub. Now, if I were to say what is the most common cause of uh, pleuritic chest pain or pericarditis as far as infections, your answer is Coxsackie B and you don't need to read really any of the rest of this slide. Uh, okay. Coxsackie B, which is a picornavirus, which is a single-stranded RNA positive sense virus. Done. I don't need anything more than that. This is, should be your studying as far as right here. This is all you should know for step. Now, I can add in extra things, right? Staph does everything, so why not throw in staph? Other things like coccidioides can do this as well. This is an infection found in like Southern California or Arizona, Southwest United States. Um, other things in the middle of the United States uh, and northeast are histoplasma. You will get to these in your respiratory sections. Don't worry about them as far as your cardio stuff. Just stop when you read Coxsackie B right there. As far as myocarditis, we need to talk about a few other things, okay? Again, most common in the USA, Coxsackie B. Bam, done. I don't need anything else from that point. 
if we're talking about the world parasitic, sure, whatever. Um, I, I'm not really telling you to necessarily study this. I will be sharing and describing those parasites in just a second as the ones that can cause this. Um, but Coxsackie B for right now, it should be the most important thing to you in regards to myocarditis specifically infecting muscle cells in the heart and damaging muscle cells. There are, uh, uh, there is another infection that you're going to get to multi-systems that affect the heart, but it's actually the vessels of the heart, like the aorta. Um, but that is usually associated with other things. And so don't, don't worry about that right now. Just focus on Coxsackie B. Um, you can have stabbing chest pain. Um, literally, uh, the, the person just comes in and says, I feel like I have a knife in my heart. Um, very specific, sharp stabbing. And it's not, uh, it doesn't change on position. Uh, where, where you talked about pericarditis, that does. Now, strep pyogenes. Uh, remember that uh, this guy can lead to rheumatic heart disease and pancarditis. So this can involve your uh, pericardial sac and your myocardium. Um, but keep in mind that um, that's usually more of a path question than a micro question, but it still could come up. That is a type two hypersensitivity. Okay, so parasites. Uh, there's a couple that we, we uh, can discuss. So the first one is Trypanosoma cruzii. This is known as Chagas disease. Uh, this guy in far further detail will come up in multi-systems. Uh, and I have really fun ways of remembering that. So uh, definitely check out those videos. And um, we have uh, another guy known as uh, Paragonimus westermini. We'll be talking about that in just a second. Uh, I've got a whole slide for him. And Balascaris uh, procyanosis uh, or a Toxicara species. And then lastly, Trichinella. This is usually a muscle infection, uh, like actual skeletal muscles, but it can involve the heart as well. And that will come up in MSK. So now on to this Paragonimus westermini. This is now your first kind of systems parasite slide uh, that we've come across. And uh, this is kind of not that high yield, but uh, I want you, you just to be able to recognize it at least. Uh, there might be a question on your world about it. Um, however, when you get to parasites, uh, we talked about this at the beginning of this video, um, it pretty much needs to understand what does the picture look like? What are the basic symptoms and where it usually infects? And then knowing uh, parasite infections in general as far as our immune response, like eosinophils and stuff like that, right? Other things, where we get it from, lastly, and infective and diagnostic stage. Those are pretty much all you need to know in regards to these. And it seems like a lot, but it's actually not too bad uh, if you read it a couple times. So uh, this guy is known as your lung fluke or water fluke. Uh, it's found in Japan, Asia, and Latin America. That's not super important. But lung fluke uh, actually is sort of important. You can get it from crustaceans like crawdads and clams and stuff like that, um, along with hepatitis viruses, as we talked back uh, in the beginning. And then uh, the infective stage is a metacercaria. And then once it gets inside, it grows into this leaf-shaped uh, Paragonimus westermini fluke. And this is uh, this guy right here. I just think of it, it looks literally like a boogie board or like one of those little boards that you, like a skim board. If you ever see those guys kind of running on the beach and there's like a little bit, you know, like an inch or two of water and they throw at this board and they jump on it and surf into the waves. Um, that uh, is actually sort of what this uh, guy looks like. That's Paragonimus westermini. So I just think of the guy surfing out on the west uh, on his little uh, surfboard skimboard thing, and that's enough for me. So diagnostic, uh, pretty much I need to see the fluke. Uh, since it's a lung fluke, it goes to the lung, and when I cough it, <coughs> you have a fluke that comes out, which I can imagine is the most fantastic thing to find at three o'clock in the morning when you start having a cough attack. Um, Actually, no, that would be horrible. Uh, other things we can detect the antibodies against it or the antigen from the actual worm itself. Um, eosinophilia, lung infection, chronic cough can come up with this. Again, last thing, it can infect myocardium, and this is why it comes up in lectures. That's pretty much all uh, in regards to this guy. Now, our Toxocara species, I like this, this guy a little bit more. Um, this is an ascarid worm. I don't need to describe that. It pretty much is a worm that comes from dogs. Uh, raccoons are specific to the Bayless ones, which uh, we'll be talking about in just a second. And then uh, this is a migratory worm. So this is an, a worm that once we ingest it, it makes it through itself through the GI tract, throughout the blood, 
and then uh, inflames all sorts of stuff. It can cause diarrhea in the GI tract first. It can migrate to organs such as the heart, causing myocarditis, as we talked about. It can go to the liver. It can go to the eye, causing blindness, as you can see in this child right here. It has a big swollen eye right here. This is actually caused from Toxicara species, and this child did lose their eye to this um, because the mother did not vaccinate, uh, did not keep her child away from uh, their new uh, puppy that they got uh, and this child ended up getting that and then it can cause what is known as neural larva migraines uh, migraines sorry uh, which means uh, the larva has migrated to the nervous system or cns infection and that could be a big problem as well and that can cause seizures and coma and death um, pretty much what you're going to see with these guys because it's a worm that's kind of it migrates all over the place you can see granulomas forming especially eosinophilic granulomas and then uh, if we were to break down this disease so person comes in they have worms migrating all over the place they have a recent puppy bam like that's it like they have a dog or they have some raccoon that they had to scare off the other day digging through their trash up in their cabin in tahoe california or something like that at that point now we're thinking raccoons or dogs what can we get from them we have a worm migrating child is blind or something like that in the stem or they have some some sort of uh, shortness of breath something having to do with the heart at that point i know we're talking about these guys so how do i separate them pretty much if it's a dog uh, that the person has in the stem it's toxocara canis if it's a raccoon it's bela sascaris uh, procyanosis or scion scionis uh, i don't really know how to pronounce that uh, correctly but uh, that's specific for raccoons. Um, and uh, this Bayless scarus actually is very commonly to, uh, associate itself with the CNS, but remember, if it's dog exposure, be looking for canis because that also can go to CNS as well. Diagnostic serology. We don't look for the worm because I don't want to be digging through someone's brain to be looking for a worm. I look for antibodies. Once I find antibodies, I give them treatment if I can, um, or else it's supportive and kind of leaving where it is. Um, so I just kind of put this cute little raccoon that's sweeping these people's floors. I, I don't know why these people have a pet raccoon, um, but I'm sure it's got its rabies shot, so it's probably safe. And that's uh, pretty much it for the cardio, the liver, and the blood infections. Uh, if you have questions, definitely post them at the bottom of this video or on my Facebook page. Um, you can actually get access to these uh, this files um, on my Facebook page, CK Med Plus. And uh, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Um, and always, uh, as always, I always like to put a little comic at the end for you guys to enjoy as you're kind of gathering your thoughts from this lesson. Um, but again, yep, don't forget to subscribe and uh, definitely check out our further modules.